Good morning. I thought I had a little more time to get ready. You know how it is. There's never enough time to get it all around. It makes you really feel sorry for our pastors, doesn't it? Their work is never done. All right. As everyone's uh, making their way to their seats, um, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to sing number 389. 389. More about Jesus. I'll invite you to stand with me, please. Stanzas. Please join me in prayer. Father, once again, we're, we're grateful for this opportunity that we have to uh, gather together, the body of Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help uh, each and every single heart and mind that is here this morning, help each one of us to set aside the world, set aside our, our careless desires for what it contains, for the concerns that it brings into our lives, the troubles that we have. Let us, for two hours, Holy Spirit, find our way to be focused on you and our Savior and our Heavenly Father alone. Pray that your word would have its way with every heart and mind. Guide us in a way that will truly make us look different than the world around us and uh, be a challenge and a light to them as well. We thank you now for this time. I ask that you go with us, teach us, and help us to praise you in a way that is worthy and acceptable. And we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Let's have everyone be seated except for the Merlau's class. Thank you, Mrs. Norton and Mrs. Norton's class. Okay, how about the Hicks's class? Thank you. That's what we're doing here today, giving praise to God. It's appropriate. How about our teens?
for that. All right, our adult class. Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1.21. All right, let's have the rest of the classes join us in standing. We'll go ahead and do our catechism question for the morning. Question 36, what do we believe about the Holy Spirit? That he is God, co-eternal with the Father and the Son, and that God grants him irrevocably to all who believe. Amen. Let's sing that last stanza, and as we're doing that, the classes can be dismissed. More about Jesus. I'll wait for you. I'm no rush. I can't imagine why you still would, but anybody need a verse card for September still? Oh, you should. I mean, just in case it's a, a working issue for you. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So there's two there. Uh, maybe there's only one there. I don't know. Yeah. How about um, homework handout from last Sunday for today? Anybody need one of those? Is that a homework handout hand? I'll get some help. Will you help me? Thanks. So Bob Elwell needs one. Mr. Talmadge needs one. Larry Sands kidney stone, which is a good thing. Is this Sands? What's Sands? Old Zach Norton needs one, as opposed to young Zach, who isn't really very young anymore. Do you have any goals? Do you have anything you want to do? You used to. Thanks, Mike. Emily, do you have any goals? Yeah, you're the only Emily in the room. I love that. Who? Emily, do you have any goals? Like? Getting a job. That's a good that's a good idea. Your parents would appreciate that. Yeah. Anybody else? You got a goal? Anybody have goals? Roger? To be available. Good. We'll talk about what you're doing to accomplish those goals in a minute. Aaron, you got any goals? To build a house. To build a house. I hear, I hear, Renda, that Aaron's going to build a house before you are. <laughs> Rent free, just like he has done with you for 20 years. I don't understand. He's paying rent now, and you're going to live rent free? All right. You got any goals, Glenna? Yeah? The, the Hickory Hill Farms, a cult, whatever. <laughs> it's me, I'm the problem. Yeah, I've heard that over and over again for a lot of years now. Anybody in this half of the room have any goals? Mr. Clinton? One goal a day. One witness a day. Good. 
Anybody else? We'll talk about what you're doing to accomplish those goals in a moment. Don? Want to finish well. Nice. And you're closer to the end now than you were yesterday. Yeah. And a week and a half ago, you felt like you were right on, the, on death's doorstep. One foot in the grave and the other foot on a banana peel. Thank you, Alice. Anybody else? Goals? Margaret? To finish well. You and Don both. All right, now I'll come back around. Sally? To reach out to your neighbors. Nice. Reach out to your neighbors, form relationships, and share the gospel. All right, what are you doing to accomplish those goals, Emily? What are you doing to get a job? I'm in college. That's what I'm doing. You're preparing yourself for a career. Okay, uh, let's see. Roger, what are you doing or what have you done to become available? My question, though, is what have you done to become available for those opportunities? Go. So you've quit working. You've simplified your life enough that you can go. Nice. Um, where was I? Trying to work. Aaron, what are you doing to build a house? Working and saving. Good. Uh, what are you doing to have one a day? You're carrying tracts. You're spending time getting to just to, to know people as you interact with them. Might be a total stranger. Might be somebody you've known before. What are you doing to finish well, Don? Yeah, trying to maintain a commitment to Christ that shows up in your everyday life. Margaret, what are you doing to finish well? Yeah, and you do that by spending time in his word, spending time with his people. Nice. Who'd I forget? Sally. What are you doing, Sally, to have opportunities to witness to your neighbors? Praying for them. Yeah, and when they come, don't be fearful. Just step out with the confidence that, that God has people in your life who need to hear the gospel. Yeah, this isn't just all about your being the silver-tongued orator like Apollos at Ephesus. This is about you being uh, a tool in God's hands, right? A fallible tool in God's hands. All right, anybody else you want to chime in about what your goal is and how you're trying to accomplish it? I don't want to leave you out. Okay, no matter what the Apostle Paul faced or endured, he kept his eye on his goal. His goal was furtherance of the gospel. You know, this is the very gospel that caused him so much pain. It was the gospel and expressing that gospel that caused Paul a lot of suffering, a lot of hardship in the first place. But no matter how hard things are, Paul's commitment is to further the gospel. Uh, turn with me to Philippians chapter 1 if you haven't already. We're going to be in verses 12 through 18 today. Zach managed to fill our time last week with three verses. I'll see if I can do the same thing with these seven. These, these passages are really quite comfortable. I mean, you'll find that next week. You're on next week, right, Ken? You'll find that uh, this is a whole different style of teaching than what we were used to last quarter where, as Zach pointed out, you're often in the minor prophets. The last two quarters, really, we were dealing with a whole book or at least a big chunk of a book. This is a different, it's a different sort of feel. It's quite uh, freeing and yet intimidating all at the same time. So take, with, take a look with me just at verse 12. Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So I trust that you, at least many of you, have read seven and a half chapters in Acts this week, probably from the middle of chapter 21 all the way to the end of chapter 28. Having read those seven and a half chapters in Acts, what kinds of things happened to Paul? Here's the first part of that question. What kinds of things happened to Paul to get him to leave Jerusalem for Rome? And how did these things lead to the furtherance of the gospel? 
So what kinds of things happened to Paul to get him to leave Jerusalem? And again, if you're thinking just in terms of chronology, I'd start in the middle of chapter 21. So the first of these is going to happen in Jerusalem, I suppose, and eventually there'll be others along the way. Roger? He was. Yeah. Can you hold, hold that thought for just a moment, Roger? He's talking about being misbeaten and misapprehended by the guards. So what is it that caused, there's something that happened before that in Acts 21, Richard, that caused him to be arrested in the first place. He's rejected by the Jewish leaders, and there were some, there were some Jews in Jerusalem who encouraged Paul, Bill, to do something to, to make himself more palatable to the Jews. Hang on, hold that thought. I want to get slightly before that. Took a vow. Took a vow. It's too late. You've, you've, I've, I heard took a vow, and I came over here. He, he took a vow. So there were these four guys in Jerusalem who were going to take a vow. And the encouragement from the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem was, hey, Paul, here's a way that you can... You can show your commitment to the law because the word on the street is you are opposed to the law of Moses, which was not true. He just recognized that Jesus fulfilled the law. So Paul willingly cooperated with these four guys who took a vow. Do you, do you know what their vow was? No. I don't have any idea what their... Did, did I miss this in, in Acts 21? I don't know what their vow was. They took a vow. I don't know that. I, I don't have a clue. So all I know in verse 23, here's the instruction in Acts 21. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. I don't know what the vow is. Take these men, purify yourself along with them, pay their expenses so they may shave their heads. In other words, pay their barber bill. Thus all will know, everybody will know that you are an observer of the law. So Paul, verse 26, took the men. The next day he purified, purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when those days of purification. Apparently this is a temporary vow. Days, give notice when the days of purification will be fulfilled in the offering, a money offering presented for each one of them. So this is Paul trying to mollify his critics participating in a vow. All right, that's going to get him into trouble, right? So... What is the assumption on the part of the Jewish religious leaders about Paul being in the temple? What, what, what bad conclusion did they come to? Margaret? Yes, he had bought, brought Gentiles or Greeks into the temple with him. So um, these Jews from Asia saw him in the crowd and assumed that he had brought Greeks into the temple and defiled the holy place. Because the day before, they saw him running around town with Trophimus. So therefore, he must be in the temple with Trophimus. They, I think they were predisposed to uh, hate Paul in the first place. So the Jews, Roger, unjustly seize him, and they intend to do what to him? Beat him to death. They intend to kill him. They are not just going to give him a signal. They're not just going to break his kneecaps. They intend to kill him. So eventually, the Roman military commander gets involved. What's, what is the, uh, the interest of the Roman military commander here in Jerusalem? What, what's his goal? Keep the peace. To keep his job. And therefore, to keep rebellions at a minimum. And so he inserts himself into this. Again, this is at the end of Acts 21, or near the end of Acts 21. He inserts himself into this and protects Paul. And the neat thing about that is Paul is able to share his testimony as a result of being arrested, which ought to be a very bad thing. I would think it was. Wouldn't you think being arrested would be a bad thing, Greg? Yeah. I've lived 58 years, almost 59 I am, as Tyler would say, almost through my 59th year. Uh, and I've managed to live that long, and not yet have I been arrested. There's time. 
I, I would imagine. So Paul gets arrested and is able then to share his testimony, and that's what chapter 22 is about. What do you think? God allows this unfortunate circumstance in Paul's life, but it's used for the furtherance of the gospel. What a neat thing. Even when life turns a bit sour, when aren't as pleasant as you wish they were, still, God can use that for his glory, for his, uh, for the, the furtherance of the gospel. It's just neat to see. This is not just Romans 8, 28, God causes all things to work out for good, like I'm gonna like it. Well, I'm, Paul didn't like it, but it worked out good for God, for sure. All right, um, I've then gotten most of the way to the end of chapter 22. Uh, there's something else gonna happen when you get to chapter 23. Anything from Acts 21, 22 that you wanna bring out in terms of what happened to Paul that gets him from Jerusalem eventually to Rome? He was misidentified. Yeah, the, the, the Roman official didn't have any idea who he was. Yeah. Yeah, this, yeah, this one of these crazies. Uh, Mary? Okay, now you're ahead of the story. Hang on, hold on. Come, we'll come back to that. I'm trying to work my way chronologically through this. I'll come back to you, I promise. Um, so the next thing is he ends up in chapter 23, seated before. It happens in the last verse of chapter 22 of Acts. Paul ends up seated before the Sanhedrin, the council. These are Pharisees and Sadducees who are going to exercise judgment on behalf of Israel. And there he begins to give his testimony, but it appears to him this is not going to go well. And so what does Paul do? He brings up a controversial subject. Just kind of neat to see. It appears that this is not going to go well for me, so I tell you what, it's, it's, because, of the rec it's because of the resurrection that I am before you today. Boy, that got the Pharisees and Sadducees arguing with one another, didn't it? What a wise man. So rather than being the, the, uh, the, the one who is in the crosshairs of the Pharisees and Sadducees together, now they're uh, arguing with one another. And eventually, the tribune gets involved again because he hears about a plot against Paul's life. Who, I'm sorry, Phyllis, It is a conspiracy by the 40 hungriest men of the Bible who have committed themselves to not eat again until they have Paul's head. I wouldn't do such a thing because I've had breakfast and I am looking forward to lunch. I don't, how, how long is this? They're going to be really hungry because it's going to be years before Paul uh, is dead. So how does the Roman official find out about the plot? The plot of these 40 hungry men. How does the Roman official find out about this? Huh? Paul's nephew. Is that his sister's son? Paul's nephew hears about the plot because he apparently runs in a rough crowd. And he goes to the Roman official and says, hey, y'all, there's a plot here on the part of these men to ambush the, the, uh, the train and take Paul and kill him. So the Roman official then, uh, he carefully protects Paul and carries him off as a prisoner, but a well-protected prisoner, to where he gets opportunity to share the gospel some more. Again, neat the way that God is working this out. Where's Paul headed? Before he gets to Rome, he's headed to a, an audience with Felix, and then later Felix's replacement, Festus. This is not... Festus, no bullets in his gun, Festus. This is, this is the replace. You remember that, Festus, Matt Dillon's sidekick. Uh, this Festus is the guy that replaces Felix. So as a prisoner in Acts, uh, the end of 23, the beginning of 24, Paul ends up sharing the gospel with the governor, Felix. That's pretty cool. I don't know our governor. Don Sleeman knows our governor.
Can I tell on you? He has a picture. He'll show it to you, I'm sure, if you ask him. He has a picture of the most honorable Gretchen Whitmer on the back of his motorcycle. Yes, I heard that gasp. <laughs> Alice says, you shouldn't tell him those things. They're going to kick us out. But what an honor to be able to share the gospel with a high official. I would, I would relish a, 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 a serious conversation with Gretchen Whitmer about the gospel's claim on her life. There's nothing going to change her policies quicker than coming to Christ. So here Paul is in Acts 24 giving a defense or sharing his testimony with Felix. Why is Paul before Felix? He's before Felix because he got arrested. He got arrested on trumped-up charges. All of that is illegitimate, and yet here Paul is in an illegitimate arrested situation giving the gospel to these officials. It's just a, it's neat to see the way that God is working out these difficult times to further the gospel. So Paul gives his testimony to Felix, and eventually in Acts 25, to Felix's successor, Festus. By the time we get through chapter 25 and chapter 26, Paul has also shared his testimony with the king, quote-unquote, King Agrippa and his consort, Bernice. Yeah, again, just a, a neat to see the way that God is using difficult times for the furtherance of the gospel. Can you remember a time, this is an opportunity for you to give testimony, can you remember a time when God has used opposition, unfortunate events in your life to further the gospel? Have you seen that in the context of your life, Ron? At funerals. Yeah, funerals are, by their very nature, sad occasions, which nobody wants to have happen. But indeed, funerals are opportunities to make the gospel clear. I've often said, uh, nothing against Patrick, our date in May next year. I've often said to my church friends, I'd rather have 10 funerals than one wedding. The reason I say that is that funerals, people's hearts, Ron, are soft, they're sensitive. It's an opportunity to share the gospel in the midst of a tragedy. I'll do the same thing in the midst of the tragedy on May the 18th. I'll share the gospel as well. But on the 18th of May, Carissa, everybody has their focus on you, and nobody really will remember anything I say. Just, I understand that. You're the star of the show on that day. All right, thanks. When else have you seen, in the context of your life, Sally, God use difficult stuff to bring about the furtherance of the gospel? Oh, COVID, that's a dirty word. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. All of that comes out of the COVID lockdown. Nice. Let me share one. I'll come right to you, I promise. So we've had some difficulty here at school these first two weeks because we get some curriculum from Abeka. Uh, some of our curriculum from BJU Press, some from Abeka. And Abeka has been really slow at getting material out of the warehouse. Stuff that I ordered is sitting in the warehouse for three and a half weeks before they finally box it up and send it on a UPS truck. It's just frustrating. But anyways, I knew that there was a UPS, a bunch of boxes from UPS scheduled for delivery Thursday. And Pam, you were kind enough to point out that they were here Thursday afternoon. But a little bit before that, I was out mowing lawn Thursday because it's my mostly day off. And I watched a UPS driver, our regular UPS driver, his name is Dwayne. I watched him back into the neighbor's driveway across the road. So I shut the lawnmower off, pulled my earplugs out because, of course, I don't use power equipment without hearing protection. I don't. I really don't. I mean, I've got to protect these things. They're the only good, they're, they're the best ears I'm ever going to have, right? Those of you that wear hearing aids, they're the next... The next years are not going to be nearly this good. So I walked over there and waited at the end of the driveway for Dwayne to get done, and he pulled out and stopped. And we've had conversations here, and I asked him if he had 
dropped off boxes at Cedar Creek today. No, it wasn't part of his route, all of that. But we got engaged in a conversation about spiritual things. And that's purely a result of Abeka not delivering our materials in a timely fashion. So again, it was an unfortunate situation, an unpleasant situation that allows ministry and furtherance of the gospel. Go ahead, Margaret. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah, and and our responsibility is to just to throw seed, isn't it? So Margaret's describing a deacon at Northeastern who was um, friends with a Jewish man who passed away, and his oh, she was Jewish. The husband wasn't Jewish. He passed away, but this Jewish widow, um, Margaret became concerned about and interacted with her repeatedly, but to no effect, apparently, in terms of gospel reception. Okay? Glenna. Who was not even supposed to be on the flight with you? The meaning of life. You thought, I know the meaning of life. We live in a Christian nation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sweet. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You ate those. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, it could be. You're just building, you're building the case for trusting Christ. That happens bit by bit, often in the lives of somebody. Mm-hmm. Right? How can I pray for you? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty bold on her part to say, I've, I'm a Christian, but I'm not living like it. Yeah. 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 Do that and, and immerse yourself in a good Bible preaching church. Nisha. I'm, I'm interested in how God has used difficult circumstances for the furtherance of the gospel. Go ahead, Alice. Yes? Did they? Don pulled his sidearm and says, get off of my porch. <laughs> yes? Yeah. Nice. Right. Yeah. These are gals who are incarcerated, um, and that's an unpleasant situation, and yet it turns out for the furtherance of the gospel, and it humbles you because even though you didn't remember those conversations, they did. Bill? Bill? Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, it, no man ought to have to watch his wife die. You were faithful to Sandy and used that opportunity as, a, as, a, as an opportunity to share the gospel. Well, you think about uh, Paul Pearson. You know, Paul went to Thornable Manor to rehab from a, was it a knee? He was up there. Was it a knee, you think? Was it a knee? Who said that? Mike said that. And then Paul used that opportunity to, to, to get engaged with the, the community at Thornable Manor. That was just encouraging. Again, it's a matter of using difficult situation for the furtherance of the gospel. God's into that. Richard? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's not me being smart. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, needed a wire stretcher. Yeah, nice. Al? Yep.
Yeah. Right. As a guy who has a sore knee, I wouldn't wish a sore knee on my worst enemy. Yet God uses that for his glory and, as we saw in Acts, for the furtherance of the gospel. I want to shift gears just a moment here. The next question is this. Same verse, verse 12 of of Philippians uh, chapter 1. I want you to know, brothers, that what what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So, in light of our reading in Acts, what kinds of things happened to Paul on his trip from Jerusalem to Rome, and how did these things lead to the furtherance of the gospel? I want you to think specifically about how God uses creation this time. How does God use creation, the gospel? All right, Mary. He got bit by a snake. Where was he when he got bit by a snake? On the island, we'll come back to that shipwreck. I know we're going out of order. We'll come back to the shipwreck in a moment. So he's on the island of Malta, and there's a campfire going. And Paul, in the midst of this campfire business, gets bitten by a snake, a poisonous viper. And all of the rest of the people around the fire expect Paul to do what? Keel over. And he doesn't. He survives being bitten by a poisonous snake. Does that bring about the opportunity to share the gospel? It does. All right, back to the shipwreck. So they're traveling from Jerusalem to Rome on an Adramitine ship. Paul and many other prisoners are being hauled across the Mediterranean Sea, and there they experience a killer storm, and eventually the boat crashes on Malta. Uh, How many people among the crew and prisoners were killed as a result of this crash. Zero. Paul had said just before this event, God has made it clear to me that as long as we stay together, nobody's going to die. And the Roman soldiers have learned to pay attention to what Paul says. Um, Somebody who knows Greek mythology, who's the Greek God who is the bringer of storms? Maybe you've learned this because you listen to Hulst's planets. No, the bringer of the storm. Jupiter, the bringer of storms. Jupiter's a big god in the Roman pantheon. He's the bringer of storms. I can only imagine when Paul finally gets to Rome, he's going to be there in house arrest for a long time, and he's sharing these stories about the trip from Jerusalem to, to Rome and the craft at Malta, and I can only imagine Paul saying, you know, Jupiter, he's the one who brings the storms, right? Of course, his audience, they all, yep, 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 right, right. Guess what? My God, my God, the God of the Old Testament, the God who was manifested in Jesus Christ, my God overpowers your God. I can just imagine that story. Uh, What else happened on on Malta, we'll come, okay. I don't know if it's a question you're going to answer. Sooner or later, I want to know what else happened on Malta. Go ahead, Phyllis. Yeah. Yeah, so they ignored Paul when it came time to leave the security of safe havens or fair havens. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yes, it did. To the point where the soldiers are trying to escape in a lifeboat, they cut the lifeboat cords and let it fall. No, no, God's in command, and Paul's his spokesman. I like that. What else happened to Paul on the island of Malta? Remember, he's shipwrecked. He's doing his best Robinson Crusoe impression. Bitten by a snake, what happens next in Acts 28? Yes, Charlene. He does. So Publius, in Acts chapter 8, verse 7, is the chief man, the head honcho of the island. And his father is sick. 
uh, fever and dysentery. And Paul visits him, prays, puts his hands on him, and heals him. How does that, how does the healing of Publius' father help to further the gospel? What's the purpose in God accomplishing miraculous healing by the hand of Paul? Soften hearts. Gives credibility to God's spokesman. Yeah. So here we are in these, these events, in this transition period between the Gospels and the maturing of the church. We see this in Acts. We'll talk about that some tonight. Um, we see this transition taking place, but God is still, just like he did with the Old Testament prophets, still using, just like he did with the disciples in Jesus' day, still using the hands of his spokesmen to do miraculous things, which gives credibility to the gospel. I don't expect that. I don't expect to visit you in the hospital. I'm glad to do that, but I don't expect to visit you in the hospital and lay my hands on you and somehow have that fix you. I expect the doctor's hands may help fix you, but I don't anticipate that, but I don't need to have that kind of credibility added to my account. Go ahead, Phyllis. Seems to be. Yes? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, so you... We hear these accounts, especially in a lot of Muslim-dominated cultures, of how God is using visions and healings even today. Um, again, it's a matter of credibility. When have you seen God use weather to further the gospel? Roger? Oh, because of storms. Yes? Yes, and you've shared gospel witness. Nice. When else have you seen God use weather? He does bring the rain. That's true. My question is, when have you seen God use weather for the furtherance of the gospel? Any other stories? Jonah. Yeah. Yeah, certainly God used a storm to, to get the attention of those shipmates of Jonah to the point where he had to fess up, didn't he? He said, I'm the guy. Throw me over. Well, maybe there's a better way. No, throw me over. And immediately the storm stops, just like that. Richard? Yeah, Jesus, in the midst of a storm, his disciples are out there on the Sea of Galilee. It's not a really big lake. The Sea of Galilee is not. It's not a Lake Michigan-sized lake. Yet storms develop in a hurry. It's down in a bowl. Yeah, and so the disciples are out there just uh, straining at the oars and fearful for their lives. These are experienced fishermen for the most part, and yet they're fearful for their lives, and along comes Jesus. Um, one time he's asleep in the boat, stills the storm. Another time he comes by, comes a walking by. Phyllis? He did. God used three and a half years of drought to get the attention of Wicked Ahab and Jezebel. God used seven years of, of minimal crop production in Joseph's day to bring about the salvation of not only his chosen people, but of a whole nation. Pastor? There you go. Right. We're really, we as a culture are really good at that, good at, at pushing attention away from God into some other explanation. I remember Pastor Branham telling this story. He was traveling down Dowling Road with somebody, I can't remember, maybe Pastor Bernard Blair, who was probably not pastoring at the time, he was just Bernard Blair, traveling down Dowling Road on a, on a, on a cold and stormy night a winter storm, and felt pressed to stop at Bill and Neva Cordray's house. You, is, am I telling this story right, Richard? Somehow, this is a, again, this is a day where you shouldn't be out driving at all, and yet God uses that event to, to bring about the, the salvation of, of a, a, 
of people in that family. Anybody else? How does God use weather, Phyllis? Yes? Yes? Tell you what's stark about Mount St. Helens. She's, Phyllis is mentioning the Mount St. Helens eruption in 19, is it 80, I think? March of 1980, I think, but I, don't, I could be wrong about the date. Is that the, the rejuvenation of the ground following that eruption was totally a shock to the secular scientists at how quickly that could happen. And that, gave, that gives a bit of credibility to a biblical timeline uh, as opposed to an evolutionary old earth timeline. And, and this, again, God used that weather event, the eruption of Mount St. Helens, and the destruction of that whole side of the mountain and all the outflow from that for his glory. Nice. All right, I'm back to Philippians chapter 1. Or I will be as soon as I turn to it. Thanks for taking a tour through the last seven and a half chapters of Acts. Paul exemplifies commitment to the gospel. Take a look at verse 12 again. Chapter 1, verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Did Paul sulk under house arrest in Rome? being grumpy with the guards to whom he was chained. Our uh, teacher's book for this lesson suggested a way to open classes to bring zip ties and bring strangers up here and zip tie them together. How long will it take before you start being grumpy with one another? Not very. So here Paul is chained to these guards and I could see how he would be grumpy and owly about that. Was he? No. Can you just imagine? So you're taking your turn, your three-hour shift, chained to Paul of Tarsus, who doesn't feel like he's a very threatening prisoner in the first place. And while you're chained to him, what's he doing? He's, he's entertaining guests, talking about the gospel. He's He's engaged in correspondence, although maybe he's dictating that correspondence. He has somebody come in and be an amanuensis. Thanks, Ken. Um, be an amanuensis to record his correspondence. He's singing hymns like he and Silas did in the prison at Philippi when they were first there. He's studying his Old Testament. He's praying out loud, I am sure. All of this is being used by God as an opportunity to make the gospel clear to those who are forced to be there. Did Paul's presentation of the gospel bear any fruit as he's in prison? Yes. So not only there in verse 13 does the whole imperial guard know about Christ, but take a look at chapter 4 in Philippians. The next to last verse, verse 22. Who sends greetings to the church at Philippi from Paul's incarceration incarceration in Rome. Who sends greetings in verse 22 of chapter 4? Yeah, those of Caesar's household. These same imperial guards who are chained to Paul three hours each a day are the same guards that attend to Caesar. These are the secret service agents of the day. And so it's clear that Paul's witness to these guards is bearing fruit. How about you? How does your commitment... How does your commitment to Christ show to those who rub shoulders with you? Your comment earlier, Glenna, about Yvonne. Glenna has a friend, Yvonne, who lives out in Hickory Hills. Neighbors with Mike and Nikki soon. And Aaron. And she says, there's a cult developing out there. Well, what, what Yvonne knows as an unbeliever, is there something different about you? There's obviously something cultish about me, she's beginning to recognize just through the, the rubbing of shoulders. You know, I see Yvonne a couple times a year. You see her more frequently than I do. She came to church with you. Uh, it's just that rubbing of shoulders that bears gospel witness. Do that because you rub shoulders with people that I don't know, the guys that work for you or the guys, the families, Brenda, that are, have students in your class. 
all of those people that you and I don't get a chance to, to interact with, others do. So take good advantage of those. Paul encourages missions. Look at verse 14, Philippians chapter 1. Most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Was Rome a dangerous place to be a Christian in Paul's day? It was. Richard? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's a threat to civilization. Yeah. Uh, Rome is the hub of pagan worship in Paul's day, P pagan worship of the Roman gods. So Paul's testimony, Paul's example to these Roman believers to share the gospel, even though they face the risk of being locked up themselves, causes them to have more confidence just the average Roman Christian, more confidence to share the gospel because of what they saw in Paul. You know, it wasn't very long after Paul wrote Philippians that persecution got worse because Nero blamed the Christians for the fires in Rome. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. Perhaps there are people in the context of your life who have encouraged you to serve God with more boldness. People who have given you a little more oomph in your witness. I got to move on to verses 15 through 17, Philippians chapter 1. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The latter, that is the ones who preach Christ from goodwill. The former, the ones who preach Christ from envy and rivalry, verse 17, the former proclaim, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Was everything perfect in the church at Rome? Not by any means. What was Paul's attitude toward others who seemed to have superior ministry gifts? So think about 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where the Corinthian believers are claiming, well, I'm of Paul. I'm of the Paul party. Or I'm of Apollos, that silver-tongued order. He said all things well. Well, I'm of Cephas, a.k.a. Peter, oh, I'm of the party of Jesus. They were all partisans. What was Paul's attitude toward these who seemed to have superior ministry gifts? What's Apollos? What's Peter? What's Paul? Just servants of the Most High God. We're just, we're, we're guys who put our pants on one leg at a time. So there's nothing special about any one of us. We're just ordinary people that God has given spectacular opportunities to. That would be Paul's attitude about that. And look at verse 18. Look what he rejoices in. Verse 18 of Philippians 1. What then? What then? In other words, what about these people who preach Christ out of selfish ambition or those who preach Christ from goodwill? What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. In that I rejoice. No matter how it happens, the fact that Christ is proclaimed causes us to rejoice. Does that cause you to rejoice? Boy, it sure should. How concerned are you about the furtherance of the gospel? Well, I guess it comes down to, if that's your goal, if the furtherance of the gospel is your goal, what are you doing about it? What are you doing to accomplish that goal? You're going to school to get a good job. You're saving money to build a house. You're carrying tracks and looking for opportunities. But if your goal is the furtherance of the gospel, what are you doing about it? Because if you're not doing anything, that's apparently not our goal. Thanks. Thanks, Ken, for passing out notes for next week. Appreciate that. Enjoy one another's company for a few minutes.